Hello everyone, JD here. This presentation is about constructivism. It has two major components, the first of which is roots and evolution of constructivism. And what I'll be talking about appears in the presentation slides that I've written. Second component, case study, proliferation and arms races, which is the common thread through the different presentations I put together this quarter. And this has five subtopics. Which country is the most feared? Secondly, advancement of the nuclear taboo. Thirdly, how did the taboo develop and why do states comply? Next, continued pursuit of nuclear weapons by, we're gonna look at specifically some nations. And wrapping up, framework to look beyond material factors, which when we say framework, we're talking about constructivism itself. All right, so roots and evolution of constructivism. What makes society and politics are the people specifically human awareness, and as such, their ideas and beliefs are antecedents that must be understood. So what's going on in people's minds? What are they thinking about? And then when they think about various ideas, how does that manifest in their behavior? How do they act upon those ideas? Most scholars agree that constructivism is not a theory, but rather an approach. When I think of a theory, I always think about propositions. Like, I guess I should take a step back. We've got human behavior all around the world. And if we're interested in better understanding it, we're going to observe it. And from those observations, we're going to come up with perhaps a list of propositions. And from those propositions, you could generate hypotheses to test, right? But constructivism isn't interested in that so much. It's an approach, not a theory, okay? And I tie this to the next point, in these slides lies more in the post-positivist camp. Positivism I associate with science. Science I automatically think testing. That's not what constructivism is about. So argue that a known constant reality simply does not exist. And oftentimes I think about like the way I like to phrase it is like the world around us is socially constructed through the way we think and our, um, our behavior that follows, right? So if you think about it, a constant reality simply does not exist. That means it's more subjective and it's not objective. I equate objectivity with science. Now, I want to say this much. When I share this, I'm not suggesting in any way, shape, or form that constructivism is somehow misguided or it's less academic or less analytical or less important or whatever. I'm just saying it's different. To me, it's a matter of category. Right? So state's identity formed from ideas, interests, values, and beliefs is not predetermined. Uh, take discourse, written and spoken language as a starting point, conveys meaning, and is open to interpretation. So I think about written and spoken language. Most policies, or maybe not, I mean, I'm going to go with most, if not many. Let's say many. Many policies are actually going to have some kind of material that is written down in a document. And, you know, it makes you think about my background in history, because technically I am a trained historian. And what historians often do is we analyze primary material, primary documents. They could be government documents or some other uh, origin, but bottom line is documents nonetheless. Governments produce a lot of records. And whether it be minutes from a specific meeting or it be an actual law that has been passed or enacted by Congress, a bill that's passed into law by Congress, let's phrase it that way, there's going to be record of it, right? So then the question is, when we look at that material, or even a speech, a speech from a member of Congress or a speech from a president, right? Or also we could add in here executive agencies. So a lot of documents are produced by government. And so constructivism is very interested in interpreting the material conveys meaning and is open to interpretation. Like what does the document mean? Like you analyze it. What did this person or people seek to accomplish? What was their mindset? And what are they hoping to achieve, right? Um, examine the process by which interests of agents are formed. That is how agents define their interests as well as how states identify threats to their interests. Now, when I think of the word, when I see the word agents, I think of political actor like an elected official. And remember, people end up in government one of three ways, or depending on your career, maybe it's multiple ways, but you get elected to government, you get appointed, 
or you get hired. And by hired, I mean you say there's a posting, you apply for it, they interview you, or they interview a series of candidates and they decide to offer the position to you. Right? So you can get elected, appointed, or hired. And when I say hired, it's more of in a normal sense, like I got hired for my position. I interviewed for it, and there were other people who were interested. They also came and they were they participated in interviews, and then the people, the leadership at the college made decision. Right? So there are different ways. But I think of when I hear the word agent, it's not like agent as in like police agent. It's like agent as in political actor. Like you occupy a specific position. You have a specific role. And it could be, and often is, part of a leadership. I would argue that, you know, it really just depends on where you are within the institution. Okay, so we're going to move on. Most constructivists agree with realists that states are the unit of analysis in the international system. However, the way states act is interpreted differently. Uh, it's difficult to separate the levels of analysis. That is, what happens within a state impacts the relations between states in an iterative process. Yeah, I mean, all countries have some form of government, and they have different types, but have some form of government. And the leadership, they're going to make decisions. I mean, this is what goes into, like, you know, we talk about policy making. In other words, is there a directive? Is there a formal law? Um, whatever it might take the form of, is there some kind of an agreement, a resolution? Whatever form it takes on, right? or even a court opinion. Whatever decisions made within government will affect how government operates, but also potentially affect how government interacts, that particular country, the government of that country interacts with other governments around the world. That's important to keep in mind. We say around the world, I always like, I'm starting to use this term, global community, right? Look at how ideas, interests, values, and beliefs constitute the social structure within states. Influence the state behavior in the international system. That makes sense to me because when people run for office or get appointed to office or get hired, there are typically good reasons why they were chosen or why people voted for them, right? People don't end up in these positions by accident. And when you want that position, you're going to carry with you a certain way of thinking about, okay, are you liberal? Are you conservative? For example, we'll just talk about ideology. And how does that inform or even potentially distort the way you look at whatever policy that you have to work on in your position, okay? But people carry with them all different kinds of ideas, beliefs, and so forth. And remember, government also has interests that it wants to protect. Okay, and also just to reiterate here, we'll say values, throw that in the mix. Because each and every one of us has some, some values that guide us. All right, so uh, look to other actors when it comes to promoting norms. Um, governments often do. The IGOs, NGOs... Regimes, social movements, and individuals operate as norm entrepreneurs. They influence both states and the structure of the system. That would make sense to me. You think about an NGO as a non-governmental organization. There are a whole, there are, I don't know how many there are out there, but there are many. And there's oftentimes multiple NGOs working on issues. And like you could, you could just pick an issue like climate change, and there's going to be a whole bunch of groups working on that issue. And maybe even if that the climate change isn't their sole focus. Maybe it's one of a list of issues that they work on. But the reason why I bring this up is because people in government oftentimes turn to these folks for ideas. Because remember, you might be really intelligent and you might be confident, but that doesn't mean you have perfect knowledge on any given issue. I don't. I mean, I spend a lot of time studying a handful of different issues and institutions and so forth. But just because I spend a lot of time doing that does not mean that I know everything. I mean, I just don't. None of us can. And perfect knowledge doesn't exist. But there are specific groups of people working on these different issues that members of government, the personnel of government can turn to for their insight and their, you know, and, and various pieces of pieces of information. Sorry, my voice cracked. Okay. So that is that. All right. Focus on the origins and evolution of shared beliefs, norms, and interests within states. Integral in establishing preferences, because this will inform decision-making. Um, preferences are tied to decision-making. That should make sense. Norm entrepreneurs disseminate new ideas, resulting in changes to the culture. Yeah, I mean, culture, uh, to me, culture is fluid. There are norms, but no one should ever think that the norms will forever remain the same. Because if you think about just like life in the United States, 
in the mid 20th century. If you were to contrast it to what we're experiencing in contemporary times, they are different. Well, why? Because the culture has shifted. Technology has changed and medicine has changed. We can come up with a whole long list. But the reason why I bring this up and it's important to mention is because there are going to be social changes that occur that are going to reflect within the culture. And remember, culture comes down to you know people's way of life. And what do, you, what do you look around? What patterns can you see? But patterns are subject to change at different points. All right, so that's it. Creates a malleable state identity, and that becomes its currency. Acts on in an international community. Yes, different states have different identities. The United States has an identity in the global community, right? And I'm going to talk more about some of these other countries when we talk about identity when we get to the case study. All right. Just want to make sure. Discuss how agents and the system are mutually constituted, i.e. codependent, and are connected to one another. An agent cannot control how other agents in the system interpret this. Just because a state acts on a norm does not mean this norm will be universally adopted, of course. I'm really interested in political culture, and I know that political culture is different in different regions, different countries around the world, right? And the political culture is going to be tied very much to the institutions they've developed, the political system, and then to what extent are people allowed or afforded the opportunity to participate. And so it makes sense to me to think about it, and it's just like, just because you have an idea does not mean that everyone is going to embrace it, and then not just embrace it, but implement it, right, or adopt it and implement it. All right, view the states in a system in an intersubjective rather than a material fashion. Agents influence the structure, and the structure influences agents, and that, that makes perfect sense to me. In other words, a political actor operating within their uh, respective office is going to be making decisions, perhaps on a daily basis. And I'm not going to say that every decision is going to have a major impact, but certainly a series of smaller decisions collectively over time can have a major impact, or there can be major decisions that have a major impact important big decisions right so it's important to remember but anyhow the reason why I'm saying is this in that role you make decisions the decisions that you're going to make are going to influence how the institution functions but also there are it's not just you or any one person within that institution there are other people as well so how do other people take what it is you you're thinking about or what you what you said or what you've done and then how does that affect how the institution functions and then how does it come back around to affect you within your role. So it's interesting. That's part of, me, part of what I think is fascinating about constructivism. Okay, let's move on to the case study. Which country is the most feared? Now, in a rational assessment, many people would say the United States or Russia, because both have stockpiled thousands of nuclear weapons, warheads. But having the most is not what's going to make the difference here. And that's not what's going to matter in this case, I think. We talk about constructivism. North Korea and Iran are the most dangerous due to their pursuits of nuclear technology, specifically weaponry. And more recently, the saber rattling that has occurred between India and Pakistan. Now, on the subject of proliferation, constructivism points to the advancement of a nuclear taboo. All right. This is tied into what we refer to as norm development, as well as the pariah status of non-signatories to the non-proliferation treaty. And this is tied into the identity of states. So we've got some states that act in a certain way, and by doing so, they create these norms. And the norms are not necessarily codified in law. They're not necessarily written down that way. We'll talk more about this in a few minutes. But the states that choose not to participate, to say, well, we're going to ignore the non-proliferation treaty, we're not going to, which means we're not going to sign on to it. And that's going to definitely affect the way that other countries who have signed on the treaty look at them. In other words, there's an identity that's tied to the fact, you know, to this, this country that chooses not to agree to the treaty, right? Okay, the fact that North Korea, Pakistan, India, and Israel 
in pursuit of horizontal proliferation, remain outside of agreements, contributes to the perception that non-member states pose a significant security risk to the international system. You know, this is a classic example of, you know, dissent always, uh, well, I shouldn't say always, let's not use an absolute, we'll say dissent often prompts some kind of conflict, meaning that when a group of people says, here's what we're doing, and then there's a handful of people, small handful of people who say, no, I'm not going along with that, those people can stir up some drama. And if you pay attention to the news, you will note that some of these countries have done exactly that. Okay. What prevented the Soviet Union or United States from deploying nuclear weapons in any of their other conflicts? The nuclear taboo evolved not on security or economic concerns or even deterrence, but rather the idea that the nuclear weapons were simply too destructive and devastating for civilized societies to entertain. I'm going to talk more about that and how it evolved in a moment. Taboo is not a legal norm, rather is considered a de facto norm as pro prohibition of the use of nuclear weapons is not codified in international law. So the use of nuclear weapons is not codified which means it has not been formally written down. Yes, we have a non-proliferation treaty, but the use has not been codified. Okay? When we think about being codified, I think of it formally being committed to paper and some governing institution has approved. When you codify it, you take the idea and you actually put it to paper and say, this is how we're going to operate. Some institution has approved it, right? How did the taboo develop and why do states comply? This is a good question. It emerged during the height of the U.S. hegemony in uh, stages. I'm going to walk you through this. From 1945 to the 1970s, the international community faced nuclear testing by major powers as well as international, international confrontations. I'll give you an example of that. The Cuban Missile Crisis, which if you look at the image that's behind the text here on the screen, that is Adelai Stevenson addressing, well, he was, I should say, the diplomat to the UN. He was addressing the United Nations during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, which is during the Kennedy administration. Right. So from 1945 to 1970s, the international community faced nuclear testing by major powers as well as international confrontations that, along with the memories of atomic weapons in World War II, provided a framework. Say a, a framework for non-use. So people are like, no, I don't know that we want to go there. I'm not I don't know that we wanted to actually go and and launch one of these missiles or drop another atomic bomb right? They don't want to do it. Why? Because you think back and you think about the, the moments where there's been tension. You think about the instances where the United States actually did. Remember, the United States is the only country in the world. We're not the only country with nuclear technology, of course, you know that. But we're the only country that has actually used a nuclear weapon against an enemy during a war or used one at all in terms of well, in that case, it's in a war, World War II, against Japan. We dropped an atomic bomb in Hiroshima and one in Nagasaki, right? And so when they actually did that, it changed the game indefinitely because you could see how much damage they caused. The passage of the Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1968 delivered the legal framework that codified prohibition against proliferation. However, it doesn't mean that people can't actually use it as a weapon against someone else. Remember, by someone else, we mean another country, one country against another. And then I'm going to actually add another dimension to this that complicates this situation in a moment. The 1995 extension of the Non-Proliferation Treaty contributed to the non-proliferation regime to the extent that most states are signatories and deem the regime legitimate. In other words, when a group of countries get together and say, we're going to agree to this, here is a series of provisions, we're going to agree to them, they're, they're essentially like 
setting this like almost like model behavior and they're setting a norm by saying this is what we're agreeing to because we think it's appropriate considering the circumstances and considering the fact that we know what it's like to actually use one of these weapons we know what can happen right and they don't want to go there because of the harm they cause right the end of the cold war and 9 11 altered the nuclear landscape new concerns emerged absent in the traditional great power rivalries by great power we mean, we mean uh, the united states versus the former soviet union okay threats from regional conflict and non-state actors so we have terrorist groups certainly terrorist groups change the game because they don't operate the way a lot of governments would they, that's why we say non-state actors in the U.S., as a norm entrepreneur, um, is re responsible for promotion of the idea that the use was inconsistent with civilized societies. We've tried to do that. Now, what explains the continued pursuit of nuclear weapons by Iran, North Korea, Pakistan, and India? Social facts that have led to the identity and perspective of rogue nuclear states, as well as intersubjective relations with the international community. Uh, compels non-signatory states to pursue nuclear technology in spite of the universal norm and the perception that they are pariah states. Pariah meaning, in this case, they're off by themselves. Most people who have gone with this, made this decision to agree to it, and a handful of states have decided not to, and they've kind of gone their own direction. Or should they kind of, they have gone their own direction. So let's go through some examples. We've got Iran. So what would be Iran's motivation? Capabilities would be a symbol of independence from Western dominance. Universal norms driven in the aftermath of World War II. So it has to do with Iran pushing back against the West. That would include the United States, of course. Um, raise the stature, not only raise the country's stature, this is Iran's stature, not only in, middle, in the Middle East, but also developing in non-aligned states. And finally, attempting to promote alternative norm of non-compliance so in other words while many people if not most are going to comply they're trying to create a new norm by not complying or non-compliance so then why did iran agree to the nuclear deal in 2015 during the obama administration well iran has been re required to reduce stockpile of enriched uranium and a number of centrifuges that produce uranium over 10 to 15 years now what are the reasons it was in their best interest to abide so in other words go along with other countries what they're suggesting and perhaps it's possible they were trying to follow in the path of north korea because in the 90s north korea agreed to agreed to well had a similar arrangement where they weren't going to and then all of a sudden by the mid 2000s early mid 2000s they changed their mind so Perhaps Iran is modeling North Korea's behavior. So let's go on to the North Korea example. North Korea, they flout the norms. When we say they, I'm talking about the government. I'm not talking about average everyday people because I don't want to blame average everyday people for the decisions made by the leadership of the country itself. So they flout the norms, policies designed to protect its citizens from the West, specifically the United States. So yes, North Korea isn't happy with the United States. And so they're going to continue to develop their weapons uh, because they essentially want to have some leverage here. And they want to be able to protect the citizens of their country. At least that's their perception. And the other point I want to make here is due in large part to the ideation factors, the goal of demonstrating to the rest of the international community that it deserves respect. So North Korea wants to develop the weapons in an attempt to earn respect from other countries around the globe. All right, there's that. Let's move on to India. India is a bit different here. Failure of the nuclear weapon states to disarm or even significantly reduce nuclear arsenals left India believing they had no choice. So in other words, the United States has at times lectured other people on this issue and others. But if the United States isn't really serious about dismantling and perhaps even abandoning, I don't ever see that happening, by the way. I don't see that happening. But India is pointing that out and saying, well, you're not disarming. You're not looking to reduce the weapons that you have available. So why, if that's the case, so why shouldn't we just continue with what we've been doing? And then also here, would secure their position as a regional hegemon 
And then lastly, symbol of independence from the West, congruent with their traditional uh, leadership of non of the non-alignment movement. In other words, remember they're one of the countries that's part of that group of folks, small group that doesn't want to sign on to the non-proliferation treaty. Okay. And then lastly, we want to talk about Pakistan. Uh, rational decision in response to India's position and also intersubjectivity. How a state's perception of another state influences their own norms, ideas, beliefs, and behavior. So how Pakistan perceives India. That'd be the, uh, the other state in this case. Of course, how they see India, and it's not just, I would say it's probably more than that. It's not just how you see it, but also the relationship that exists or does not exist. That's definitely going to inform your norms, ideas, beliefs, and behavior. Okay, I want to wrap up by talking about the framework to look beyond material factors. Constructivism provides a framework to look beyond these material factors, is the way to phrase it. Allows us to understand how and why the nuclear taboo developed in the face of national security concerns and how counter, counter norm is emerging. And then also helps explain why countries continue to seek nuclear technology as history, identity, language, and discourse come together. And this specifically could converge with the state's interests. When I say the state, we mean the individual country's interests. Okay, there is a series of resources that you can look at if you're interested in the description below. And I want to thank you for listening. Peace.